So welcome, friends. We're really glad to have you with us at the National Monthly Webinar. I'm Joe DeBoltz, uh, Vice Chair of the Board and a member of Pittsburgh One Chapter, and I'll be the moderator for tonight's event. I'm not usually quite so deep <laughs> voice, mm -hmm. but I have a cold, so I'm all equipped with uh, lozenges and water, and I hope I won't cough in your ear. I'm going to try to keep my mm -hmm. finger on the mute button. Uh, a few reminders before we begin. Please keep yourself on mute during the meeting, and I think most of you know where to find the, that mute button on your toolbar. You'll also find on your screen a view button, and you can click on that and have the option of either gallery view or speaker view, um, uh, whichever you prefer. And finally, and I know a lot of you are already doing this, please enter in chat where you're from. And I know we have some new people joining us tonight. As Wendy mentioned, we had a big registration for this event, and we're glad that you're joining us. Together Women Rise is a powerful community of women and allies dedicated to achieving global gender equality. We have hundreds of chapters across the U.S. where our members come together to learn and to fund grants to organizations that empower women and girls in the global south. We also have a growing number of individuals like you who join us online for events like tonight's monthly national webinar, our monthly advocacy group, our book club, and we'll share more at the end of the evening about upcoming events. But you can always learn more about upcoming events, our grantees, opportunities to join or start a chapter, our travel program, and much more at togetherwomenrise.org. Every month, we feature an organization working to address issues that are barriers to gender equality. Our featured grantees receive a grant of between thirty-five dollars and $50,000 to support their important work. Our August featured grantee is Colors of Connection and its Girl Awakening Program for Adolescent Girls in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Colors of Connection partners with communities, and uses public art and creative activities to make sense of traumatic experiences, generate problem solving and coping skills, enhance self-confidence, and build social and emotional health. The Colors of Connection website includes a powerful quote from Brene Brown, which is, art has the power to render sorrow beautiful, make loneliness a shared experience, and transform despair into hope. Before we hear more from our speakers about Colors of Connection, we're going to share a video with more information about Girl Awakening. And Wendy, I think I hand it off to you for that.
started with our initial project, we discovered how important and interesting it was to promote positive imagery of women and girls in GOMA and in DRC. I think it's just a good opportunity for them to reflect on the position of women and girls in society and what they want to promote and put forward. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, I think you can see from the video why we're so enthusiastic about this project. And we're pleased to have representative from Colors of Connection with us tonight. Christine, Christina Malley is the executive director and co-founder of Colors of Connection, and Laura Hoffman is the board chair. I had an opportunity to speak briefly with each of them this week. And in those conversations, I asked each what all of you should know about them beyond their bios, which are impressive and on the Colors of Connection website. I encourage you to take a look. Christina described to me a bit about the journey she's been on with Colors of Connection, figuring out a place for the arts in low resource countries that are fragile and have a history of conflict. Some of that's been overcoming skepticism among community leaders, as well as funders and donors about the power of art to heal and empower, skepticism that disappears when they see the results. Not surprising when I asked Laura to tell me what you should know about Christina, she described Christina as the little engine who could, that while she's unassuming and calm, she's also tenacious, relentless, and persistent, a thousand percent dedicated to the people and places where she's chosen to do her life's work. And I would note, some of you heard this, that it's after 2 a.m. in the Congo, and so Christina's presence with us, despite the hour, I think is an indicator of her dedication. Laura came to the board of Colors of Connection with decades of creative work, including arts therapy. When we spoke, she told me about the importance of personal connection, that she doesn't know how to be on the planet without finding ways to connect with people and noted that women have never had the consistent level of support needed to thrive. When I asked Christina about Laura, Christina told me that Laura has been a supportive and perceptive partner, very tuned into what Christina is trying to do and accomplish as a founder and how to realize that vision while navigating the growth of the organization. Interestingly, Laura and Christina have never met in person which speaks, I think, to their skill in building meaningful connections and relationships, even when that's happening virtually. Christina, I didn't see Pamela on the call, so I'm assuming she was not able to join us. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. So as I turn things over to Christina and Laura, I'm going to encourage you to put your questions and comments in chat. Wendy will monitor and she'll share those with our speakers. So Christina, I think we'll let you start. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction. And I also have a slightly deeper voice than usual because I also have a cold. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we're aligned on that. Um, and it's been a lovely experience so far, everyone that I've met with Together Women Rise, it's been such a warm welcome um, I 
thought we would give a really brief introduction and then just open it up for questions because I feel like that's the most interesting part of, um, of engaging. Um, I did want to share that I came to this work through a personal experience with art and being an artist and learning that I was interested in art, you know, from a young age. And as an adolescent, I um, really found it meaningful at times when I was having um, more difficult points in my life. So I think that personal connection to art is what's driven me to, to believe that it's, it's so important for others to have it. Um, and in particular, it, the organization was co-founded by myself and a friend, Lori, we were really struck by the fact that um, work, when we're working in um, post-conflict areas, how, how difficult it is for people to move forward in their lives. And even if you know, they're struggling with the very basics, um, but they also need something that provides them um, hope and joy and encouragement. Um, so I think that's really been our conviction that it's it's an important piece to um, to offer people who are rebuilding their lives post conflict who have experienced trauma that they need um, also space for um, expression and connection and um, some kind of healing process. Um, yeah, so I thought I'd just share that as an initial um, what's instigated this work. We did, um, we started the organization in 2011 and in 2015 um, really became more aware of the issues that girls face. And to this day, I'm still quite, um, I'm always, I'm almost always a little bit surprised by how consistent it is that girls are the most marginalized, the most excluded <laughs> from all resources. Um, and the daily ways that it impacts their lives. So now our programs focus um, exclusively on girls and the Girl Awakening program is a girls program. Um, and I feel that creativity offers something powerful to girls in particular because they have, they need those safe spaces for expression and connection with each other. Um, and then our work, we not only do individual arts activities, but we also do uh, public murals. And that piece has been really powerful to see. It's mentioned in the video how when girls are out in public spaces doing this work, um, there's um, an immediate interaction with the community and a reaction really to the fact that they are women and girls, but yet they are doing something that in everyone else's heads is only meant for men and boys. Um, so it's a way to challenge and like really positively work with this issue of social norms. Um, so that's, those are the basis of what we're, the Girl Awakening program is based on. Um, I will just provide like just a few details about it. We're working with 260 girls. Um, in the program now in one neighborhood in Goma, which is where I am now in Eastern DRC. Um, and we're providing both arts activities um, combined with essential life skills, um, like learning about menstruation and consent. Um, and then we're also providing them with school scholarships. Um, and then we have the community engagement piece through public murals. Um, I think I'm gonna leave it there and ask if Laura would like to add anything. Yes, um, I thought it's important for people to know uh, that Colors of Connection did a resource map, which was the first of its kind in that area. Um, and by resource map, it includes um, danger zones, so it's sort of almost like a safety map. It might locate where there are brothels and bars, which are uh, important to know when you're out on your own, um, the sort of avoidant uh, areas. 
but also um, because we are focused on our mission, we can't provide all resources, but if we help, we help to identify where there are health resources, where there are libraries, schools, um, counseling, uh, other local organizations. So the process, and Christina, you can add if you want after that about the map, but so that map was part of uh, our contribution to the community. Also, it helps support our agenda um, and helps uh, us connect to other local organizations. Our, the local organization part is really important because while Girl Awakening is, the agenda is to create a year long sustainable program in, in affiliation to a local organization. Um, prior to that, it wasn't. So that's one of the markers of our progress over time, right? So we started as coming in for six weeks at a time and leaving, keeping some sort of tangential connection and then coming back. And now we're actually year round and working with partners. Um, and the other thing I, just, I wanted to add to highlight was the uh, very intimate work that Christina is doing with the women and girls there with the assistance of mentors, most of which have been in the program previously as participants. So there's almost like a stepping up um, as well as then they actually also connect and some of them have continued to connect into the community beyond. So from the program, there's these very intimate settings where there's um, uh, storytelling and personal narrative, self-discovery and identity issues. Uh, then also pure didactic educational things like reproductive health and how to source and resource in the community. And then um, also the, the girls get to get out in the community and present themselves um, through public speaking in small groups with other, other organizations. So, I just, um, so the reach while we've gone from smaller groups and now we're working with 250 young women the reach per project is much larger because it includes in some way, right, um, through osmosis and also direct uh, contact, siblings, family, extended family, community leadership. And then once the murals are up, the general public actually sees the messaging. They witness the production, but they also witness the messaging. All right. Um I do have a few questions in the chat. Um, I didn't get to those. I wonder, I, I often, everyone in, appreciates hearing some specific stories um, about either you know, a, a girl that, that you can tell us about that, that has benefited from this program, or maybe about a specific art project that you worked on that, that had a real impact. Um, would either of you like to share something a story that, that you might recall? Um, I think that that would definitely be me. Um, it's hard, I'm just trying to think of where to start. Um, well, yeah, with the, the participants who are currently in our program, we have two um, twin girls and they look pretty identical. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so it was always like the our um, challenge to try to we're, we always try to learn you know everyone's names and that's very important but like especially to tell them apart um, and they um, I think one of their pictures is actually in I'll, I'm not sure where it is in the presentation or on the website but there's one one where one of them is actually speaking in front of a mural and during one of our community forums, which is this point of engagement where the girls get to talk about what the work that they've done and what they've learned with community. Um, and I learned later because we had, um, we had a, a event where we brought the parents in um, and asked them to share anything that they wanted to, um, that these, these two twins were, just completely shut down and like very shy apparently, but I would never have known that um, because through the process of the program, they became, I mean, they were just like, they really expressed themselves, they engaged with others, they, then they, you know, one of them got up in front of, you know, 30 community people and with a microphone and started 
talking. And um, so I just was, personally, I was like very amazed by that. Um, and the fact that um, that transformation occurred over such a short period of time, this is a couple months. Um, but yeah, and it, yeah, I think it just strikes me that there's, you know, not enough parenting happening. Parents are stressed. They don't have a lot of time. This, this woman was a single mother. Um, and she also, yeah, I mean, I'm also thinking about how there's not so much understanding of how adolescents are and their behaviors and always very um, much understood. And so I think just when we were able to create a space where they felt more comfortable, I think it really helped their relationship with their mom and um, they just opened up a lot more. So, yeah, that's yeah, one. Kind of leads into, you know, uh, several people have, have asked about how your program is received within the community and specifically within the young girl's um, own families. I, I mean, for example, this mother, did, you know, did she, she grateful for the program did she support it was she, you know um how, yeah. how was it supported in the community yeah it, um no she's she's parents were very happy the the parents that did come it was majority women um there were a few men though um who showed up and another thing that we learned in that um, meeting was that the women talked about how they were very grateful that we talked about menstruation and um, sexual and reproductive health with their daughters because they were too um, ashamed to talk about it with them. And that's, those, that's how they described it. And so um, that was really lovely. And actually, I think, I, I'm sure that, that I'm not a parent, but I could see how that would be the fact if I was a parent as well. Like I'd rather have someone else maybe explain some things that would be uncomfortable to have a conversation with my own daughter. Um, but yeah, they were, they were very uh, receptive to that. And then we did have, um, you know, talking about sexual reproductive health is a sensitive topic and it is, you know, taboo. And so it's not all, it's not that every single interaction has been positive. Like for example, we were just recruiting new girls into this recent round. And um, one of the parents told us that, you know, someone in the community had been saying that we were teaching the girls about sex um, and that, but she herself had, had like, you know, kind of tried to set the record straight about what we were actually doing. Um, so there definitely is, um, there is, you know, perceptions by some that, we shouldn't be talking about some of these topics. Um, yeah. I don't think it's just in your community that that, that sometimes comes up, isn't it? Um, Laura was chat, said in the chat that she might be able to show some of the pictures of the murals. Laura, I've given you permission to share your screen and that would be great because so many of the questions are related to, you know, what are the messages in the murals and, you know, um, uh, people would, would love to see that. And, and maybe if you could comment on, you know, do you have a problem with vandalism with the murals? Um, uh, you know, just how, how, what do people, people think of the murals themselves? Yeah. Um... There you go. Awesome. Um... Tell, tell us about these. Yeah, so, so these, these so far are all the ones she's showing are in Goma, where I am now. Um, and they're about um, promoting, well, this one in particular is about appreciating the role that women have in society. So there was several, there was a group of them. And one, um, you know, challenged certain um, roles that women can have. This one was about recognizing that she is um, like the pillar of the society in a way, like she's holding everything together. And so um, what is represented here is the, the caretaking role that she has. And then it's, it's realized through her being a doctor. Um, and then also 
she's um, there's another image of her uh, taking care of and cleaning in the community. Um, this one is about um, showing her in a role that there's there's very few women in um, higher kind of careers and in I think in political leadership it's only seven percent or something in DRC. So this is about um, promoting her in a a a role that she wouldn't otherwise have. Um, and similar to this one, this is a a female construction worker. Um, so you know, women are so incredibly strong, but yet they don't typically have certain roles, which is very, very interesting. Yeah, and yeah, these are all um, Goma ones. Was there a specific question about? Um, yeah, uh, someone was was asking about the messages, and this, these are gorgeous murals. First of all, the artistic talent is amazing, and the messages are incredible. And someone was asking about whether or not, um, you know, there's any vandalism. Um, they asked about whether there was any value to the murals. I, I don't know if you can answer that, but, um, you know, once again, sort of to that question, we're always very interested in, you know, how, this is sort of breaking the norm and the tradition showing women in these different roles. Is there any, you know, feedback to that? Um, any reaction to the, to the murals, um, positive or negative? Um, We've had, with the monitoring evaluation we are, we're doing, um, we've we've tried different things. Like one of the things that we recently did actually was just to have um, some of the young women who are working with the girls stand next to the mural and ask people who are walking by, like, what is one word that you what that you think about this? And all the words were really were really positive. Actually, um, the only ones that were not were actually related to them being disappointed that their own children didn't participate in the project. <laughs> um, so it was more, yeah, it was a little bit different type of feedback. Um, yeah, so, I, and in terms of vandalism, um, the only vandalism that's happened has been kids, actually, <laughs> like really little kids kind of, who are just hanging out and then end up, you know, like yeah. scratching the surface. So we try to keep, um, oh, this is one of the twins actually. That's the image oh. that I was referring to. Um, yeah, so we try to keep, the best location for a mural is where it's a little bit higher and a little bit out of reach um, because it, yeah, if it's right, if it's accessible to people touching it, it can get a little yeah. bit, um, yeah. But it doesn't sound like there's, you know, any intentional vandalism because people have problems with the messages or anything. It sounds like it's very well received. Yeah, no, we haven't had that. And I think part of that is also that we work with the community leaders in um, the whole process and they have, they, they actually frame um, some of the themes and then it's the girls who take those general ideas about, for example, equal rights between boys and girls. And then they realize, they think about how they would like to, to um, see that visually. So the community leaders are, we have, because we have their support in it and they're involved, I think that, that definitely helps. Um, that's one of our first murals from Liberia in 2011. And I went back there in 2015 and it was actually still in really good condition. That's, that's absolutely gorgeous. And a number of people have commented on, um, you know, the, uh, the, the city of Goma, the, the area uh, of Goma being, you know, kind of a tough area. And, and in fact, the country itself has experienced a great deal of conflict. And has that impacted your work at all? And are you getting support from the local authorities, um, uh, you know, at least when you run into any problems? Yeah, I think, um, let's see. Yeah, I think I mean, we're able to do our work um, with our programs because we need to be out in public spaces. We can't work in highly insecure <laughs> zones. Um, and so Goma has, you know, a level of security that during the day it's, you know, it's okay um, to be out in the streets. And then once the neighborhood knows you, you have, I think 
I feel fine. Um, I think maybe, maybe one of the things that's challenging is right now we're, as Laura mentioned, we're, we've done resource mapping and we're really trying to um, show where, where certain resources are lacking. Like for example, there's no recreational girls only safe space in the neighborhood that we're working in, which is 48,000, um, which is, it's like Goma itself is 1.5 million, but this neighborhood is 48,000. Um, and in terms of advocating for that, it's, it's tricky to know where to start. And, and I think that some of the, like the community leaders who are um, at the local government level aren't necessarily that motivated and they themselves are kind of overburdened by the dysfunction. Um, and so I think just thinking about how, cause what we, what we really wanna do is change how girls are accessing, to have give them more access to services in their neighborhood, to change how safe they can feel in certain areas, as Laura mentioned. Um, and to change that, you need the community behind you, but then you also need them to be able to get resources like from a higher level government or from um, you know international aid agencies. And so we're just trying to figure that out now, and it's it feels a bit daunting. I think that's one of the challenges. That's, that's fair. Um, I have a question about how the girls are, are chosen or, or, or if they are chosen to participate in the program and what age groups you target. Yeah, um, so we, we've we done a door-to-door um, -door recruitment process. Um, okay. And so that purposefully so that we're not saying, hey, anyone who hears about this program can come and then the, the ones who really need the program don't hear about the program. Um, so the idea is to reach really like those who need the program the most. Um, and then we, we, did, we did an initial survey actually to see where in the neighborhood there might be girls who were experiencing more difficulties um, and that's where we started the work. So that, that survey is, um, some of our tools come from the population Council, which some people might be familiar with, um, but they have a lot of great um, best practices and tools um, for girl center programs. So we we focus there and then door to door. Um, and then the idea is that anyone who corresponds to the age group that we're working with is automatically in the program. Um, so right now we're working with age 10. Um, and we're trying to, and so we're working within a certain part of that neighborhood with um, so that we're not excluding anyone it's just depending on the geographic location um, and then we some social change theories have shown that like that concentration of um, many people going through the same program and having the same level of support will really help them support each other in the future and then be able to kind of maybe affect change more easily in their community because they have that solidarity among each other. So uh, that's our strategy. And then, you know, of course we wanna grow beyond this one specific area in the neighborhood and reach all girls who are age 10 in the neighborhood, for example, but um, that's where we're starting now. That makes sense. Um, I, I did have a question about whether you ever have boys who are interested in joining in or if there's anything similar to this in the community for boys. Um, yeah, there's, there's not the same, there's not the same program. Um, boys have other access though that girls don't in the neighborhood, like sure. they're able you know, to, there's a sports area, like I said, um, there's no s recreational spaces for girls, but there are for boys. Um, so I wouldn't say it's um, a lot that they have to work with, but they definitely have more. They have access to a few recreational spaces and then they can move around more easily without the same threats that girls have. Um, so, and then, from, as I, I mentioned in the introduction, we, we have worked with um, groups that were 
both boys and girls in the past. Okay. Um, yeah. And then just found that um, girls were frequently more marginalized in those groups. And it was, um, and that certain conversations and yeah, types of expression just wouldn't happen in a space where there was also boys. Absolutely. Unfortunately, I think we've run out of time. Um, Joe, can I turn it back over to you? Sure. Thank you. Thank you again, Christina and Laura, for spending time with us. We, as I said earlier, love the work you're doing. We so appreciate it. And we're really grateful to have the opportunity to support Grow Awakening. So thanks for sharing with us. Thank you, Thank you so you. much. We'll turn to our next speaker, Zach Fowler, who's the head of strategic partnerships for Amplify Girls. Zach is going to give us an update on the impact partnership grant we awarded Amplify Girls at the end of last year. Amplify Girls is a collective made up of 25 partners across four countries in East Africa, Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda. They serve 60,000 adolescent girls in their communities. And Zach will tell us more about the work of Amplify Girls. But before we hear from him, I'd like you to know a little bit more about Zach. When I spoke with him the other day, I learned I was talking to someone who has a long history with Thrive. Zach is the former executive director of Wiser International, which was our November 2018 featured grantee. At that time, Zach visited with a number of our chapters, some of you may have met Zach in the past, um, and he shared that he's also met with our own Vina Kanke on many occasions, including making presentations to her classes. He told me that being with us tonight feels like um, a reunion with old friends, and I would say we feel the same. Zach is also the youngest ever board member of the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics Foundation a former Benjamin N. Duke scholar and recipient of the Paul Farmer Award for Justice and Social Responsibility at Duke University. So I'm going to hand things off to Zach to tell us more about what Amplify Girls is up to. And as we did earlier, Wendy will monitor the chat for your questions and comments. So welcome, Zach. Thank you so much, Joe. It is such a pleasure to be here with all of you. As she said, I am a huge fan of the work that Together Women Rise does. I am a huge fan of all of the different chapters around the nation, and it's been a pleasure to get to work with members in several different capacities uh, over the years. So as Joe mentioned, I am here to give you an update on Amplify Girls and what we are working on. I do have a presentation to share with you all. So we'll go ahead and jump into that here. Everyone seeing this okay? Does that look okay, Wendy? Beautiful, okay. So I'm gonna talk a lot tonight about the word agency and, and what agency means. It's something that uh, I think all of us are familiar with in passing as a concept. Some people equate it with empowerment. Some people equate it with self-esteem or confidence or independence, but it's possibly the most important word in Amplify Girls repertoire. And I'm going to explain why. Uh, because this really is our ultimate goal that you're looking at here is agency for every girl and opportunity for every leader that believes in that girl. So here's what we are working on currently. As Joe mentioned, we are a collective. We are a group of 25 different grassroots organizations spread across multiple countries. And our work as a group is to amplify the voices, work and impact of those community-driven organizations that are investing in the agency of girls. And we do this through really three arms. We call them our support arm, our demonstrate arm, and our advocate arm. And what that means really is we are taking all of these grassroots organizations who are on the ground, nose on the ground, focusing on local issues and local challenges with local solutions, and we are helping them transcend some of the challenges that come from being a small-scale local actor. Uh, you know, when you're when you're working locally and you know the challenges that are in your backyard, I think many of us know that can make you uniquely effective. But it also means it's a little harder to get the attention of the big guys in international development. You know, the the United Nations and the 
uh, you know, UNICEF, they're, they're, not, they're not necessarily as plugged into these extremely small scale localized solutions that may be the most impactful and effective interventions in the world. You just wouldn't know about it because you haven't heard from them. So we are working diligently to try to elevate the work of some of those organizations that are working specifically with adolescent girls in their backyards. And we do that by providing opportunities for them to work together and build capacity. We offer them holistic trainings and development programs where they can shore up their own organizations, create some sustainability, create some uh, extra layers of, of skill uh, to, to prepare themselves for growth. We also provide them with access to world-class research tools because many of you, if you're connected to grassroots organizations, you know that a challenge that small organizations face all the time is they say, we're doing wonderful good in our backyard. We've you know, housed this many orphans. We fed this many people. And uh, the, the big funders out there and the big international development actors ask, what's your impact and can you prove it? Prove it to me. And it's really hard for some of these small organizations to do that. And that's one of our priorities as Amplify Girls is to step in and help them demonstrate that impact. Uh, and then lastly, we want to put them in the driver's seat of more decision-making spaces. We want these big actors to pay attention to what these grassroots organizations are learning on the ground. So this is a, a picture of some of our, our partners. As I mentioned, uh, more than 25 organizations now uh, across four different countries. We are actually in the middle of expanding. We are growing to five countries. So uh, already Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and Rwanda are in our collective. We are adding Malawi this year. Uh, and we are planning in the next few years to start growing beyond East Africa for the first time. And by 2024, our goal is to have a collective within India as well. So to start to grow to other regions of the world. Here's what we're doing right now with that collective. This is what we're doing with some of those partners. So first and foremost, I mentioned those capacity building trainings, right? Things we're doing to help lift those organizations up. These are all examples of trainings we've offered to our membership this year. Uh, and you can read them for yourselves, but some of my favorites here are approaching major conferences. As some of you know, as COVID restrictions are starting to lift, more and more networking opportunities are happening in person, which means these small grassroots founders or uh, representatives of organizations are getting thrown back into the fray of networking again for the first time. And we wanna make sure that they are equipped with the knowledge needed to really win out and have really successful conferences and opportunities. Um, we're also trying to help them understand how to work in their local advocacy spaces. That introduction to local advocacy training was a big deal for us. Um, there are a number of regional issues facing our organizations right now. Some of you may know there is a new policy for sexual reproductive health that's influencing a number of East African governments right now. We want our partners to be prepared to respond to that. Uh, Kenya is facing its national elections next week, which raises a lot of questions around safety and politics. And so our Kenyan partners have a lot of questions around how to engage with local advocacy. That's something we're training on as well. Another thing we're working on, I mentioned agency. Uh, so we're doing a bit of research on this phenomenon. So one of our bread and butter projects is what we call the agency survey or the Amplify Girls agency tool. And what this is, is a, it's a survey, it's a measure, something you can take uh, for yourself if you wanted to. And it is the world's first psychometric measure of agency. Now, what does that mean? What that means is that historically, when we've wanted to track agency in a girl, is she showing more agency? We've had to use what we call proxy measures. So that means, you know, we've looked at something adjacent to agency, not does she have agency, but does she have control of a household budget? Uh, does she feel comfortable speaking for herself? Does she know how to find a job? And we've kind of said, if yes, she must have agency. What we're trying to do is take that first step away. So there's no if A, then B, it's just B. <laughs> so just a survey that just measures agency on its own as a standalone psychometric measure, uh, as something you can gain, lose, learn, forget, just the same way you would think of confidence or self-esteem or empowerment. This is a very valuable tool. And the reason why it's so special that we're developing this is because there are thousands and thousands and thousands of girl power organizations all over the world who struggle to define and measure what girl power is. 
And we believe we have a proposed answer to that question of what girl power is and how to track it. And the thing that's special about Amplify is that that measure was created by our grassroots partners. So these organizations that I mentioned, they are the ones who gave the data and the input and the guidance uh, in the research processes that led to that tool. So they created this measure on their own and are actually co-authors on the research that's come out of it. And so our goal is for this to eventually be a standard in international development, and it will have come from the minds of these grassroots leaders. And so we're very excited about that opportunity. What you're seeing in front of you is something that just came out. It's a, a one-year study of the result of applying that agency survey to our partner programs. So we asked all of our partners, go ahead and track your own work and show us the results. And as you can see here, the baseline information is that every one of our partners uh, is showing an increase in the amount of agency in the girls and their programs uh, over the course of one year. And we will continue to track this and grow elsewhere. So speaking of growing it elsewhere, uh, that's one of our current missions. The Girls Agency Lab, or GAL, is what we call our expansion project for this survey. How do we get this to more people? How do we get this to more organizations? Um, how do we make sure that more people are able to track agency in this way for the girls they serve? And this is going to happen in three stages. So the first step is we need to further strengthen that tool. So we need to be really sure this can be an industry standard. And the question is, how can you be sure about that? Well, one of the things you could do is validate it in many locations. So are we getting the same results when we give it in Rwanda or in Uganda or in Tanzania or in Kenya? And are we getting the same results when you validate it across those countries? So is it the same in rural Uganda and urban Uganda? So that's the, our next step for us, is to start finding more and more geographies to try out this tool. The next step will then be to create equal access to the tool and all of its results. So we are going to create an open online platform for people to be able to access the tool at whim. They'll be able to collect their own data, use the survey themselves, plug that information into an online form. We will analyze and give it back to them. And they'll have the opportunity to evaluate their programs and learn without any cost or expertise needed on their end. That's what it means for us to make this truly equitable and to help some of those grassroots organizations start proving their impact to those big guys that have a hard time paying attention to them. And then lastly, eventually we hope that evaluation turns into applied learning that improves that program. Now, one of the questions we often get is, so now they've learned how to improve their programs, they've tested their agency scores, uh, and they want to improve. How are they supposed to do that? So right now we're, we're launching a new initiative this fall to develop a fund that will provide small grants to those organizations who want to make improvements. So now they've created the tool, they've used it to measure their own programs, they see where the holes are, they wanna get better, and we wanna be able to say, here are the resources that you need to try the things that might make it better. So that's one of our major priorities this year. And then lastly, we are starting to spread the word around this work. We're starting to share this information. And in September, we'll be hosting an event called the Agency Symposium, where we will be inviting uh, partners to join us, to learn from the implementers on the ground who are uh, trying this work, who are participating in Amplify trainings, who are advocating locally, and who are using the agency survey around why this matters for them. And the symposium is going to take place in the middle of the UN General Assembly meeting that's happening in mid-September, as you can see there. So a uh, quick little update. If there's opportunities to learn more, you can visit us at amplifygirls.org. You can uh, keep an eye out for the, the agency symposium that will be on our website. You can register and attend virtually. Uh, our research report that I mentioned, that one-year trial, is available on our website as well. And we'll be hosting a, uh, an event, an in-person event in San Francisco in late October. So if any of you happen to be in the Bay Area, you could come visit me, and I'm happy to share some information there. So Thanks to you all. I know that's a lot of information in a short time, but I'll, I'll pause and pass it back for any questions or comments we might have. Thanks, Zach. Um, hey, I wonder if you could put up your presentation again, because there's a question in the chat about this one of the slides, the slide that showed the um, baseline. I see it was quite right there. Um, so, so I wonder if you can maybe explain that a little bit more. Sure. And I think I understood this is not this is this was sort of the you trying out the survey within your partner organizations is that correct and and the question is specifically if you look at the total gain from the initial baseline to the end point medium and high levels of, of intervention 
seem to be the most impactful? <laughs> that was yeah. a question, Susan. I'm sorry if I botched it a little bit, but just explain this a little bit more, I think. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So yes, Susan is right. So what you're seeing with this chart when it says dosage is basically how many hours of a program is a girl getting. So a high dosage program might be something like a girl is in a school run by an organization. So at all times, she's getting some kind of programming because they run the school, you know. Uh, low dosage might be something like once a month, they have an after school meeting. And then medium and medium high is between the two. So Susan is reading this correct. Our, after one year of tracking scores across these 25 organizations, it seems, the data seems to show us that medium dosage is the most, you could argue, impactful and possibly the most efficient. Um, it may even be that there is diminishing return at higher dosages. So if a girl is in 10 hours of programs a month, that might be the perfect sweet spot. And you won't actually gain much more by putting her in 50 hours of programs a month. Um, we're still exploring that in further detail, but Susan is reading the chart exactly correctly. That's right. So there's also something interesting to look at here when it comes to high dosage. Many um, local leaders, as you can see, when they're starting high dosage programs, like a full-time school, uh, they're working with girls who are well below average in age least score, which I think says a lot for the insights of local leaders, because that means that they're seeing a critical program and saying we need to respond with a holistic solution. Okay. Um, please, anyone, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, there was something that you said that, that really caught my interest at the beginning when you were talking about initially about agency and that you're, you know, a lot of organizations have struggled with how to define and measure girl power. Mm -hmm. So from the work that you guys have been doing, how, how do you define girl power? It's a great question. It's an amazing question. So agency for us is what we call a composite metric, which means it's made up of four different things. That's all it is. So it has four parts. The easiest way to understand the four parts is that they are internal and external beliefs and internal and external skills. And to put that in practice, what that really means is agency is when a girl, internal, external belief, internal, external skill. I believe that I deserve to be happy, safe, and successful. I believe that all girls deserve that as well all people, regardless of gender or opportunity. That's the external belief, right? Because I have these beliefs, I'm going to set a plan for myself to get what I want. And then I'm going to act that plan out in a way that gets me where I want to go. So that's the internal, external, internal, external. It's the combination of those four things that we call technically agentic capacity. That's agency. Wow. And, and the girls that are being asked these questions, I, I mean, mm -hmm. give me some examples of the kinds of questions you ask to get at this. Oh, that's a great question. That's a great question. So the survey actually takes a measurement of all four of those things separately, and okay. then the combined is the result. So it could be everything from, um, you know, from a, from a scale of strongly disagree to strongly agree. Um, People deserve uh, the, the right to bodily autonomy regardless of their gender, things like that. Um, or, or I believe that uh, boys and girls are equally good at most jobs, things like that. That's a way to yep. kind of track external beliefs. Um, so those are the kind of things you're seeing. When it comes to skills, it's uh, kind of self-reported confidence. So it's when I need to achieve a goal, I know who to ask for help. Uh, when I want to achieve something, I know how to name the steps to get there, things like that. This is fascinating and, and, and have, you know, on the surveys that you've done so far with girls is what have you generally found is, are the girls, you know, agency fairly low or is it, it's a good question. So, so what we found is that most of our partners are working with girls who have below average agency. Sure, that, that, and that would make sense. Not surprising, right? right. Um, and that by the end of the program, everyone has come to have above average agency. Great, that means largely they're working. Yes. Um, what we have discovered that's really interesting is the change in agency is gradual. 
which makes sense if you think about the full span of their life. If you think of agency as something you develop over the course of a lifetime, right? I mean, speaking from my own self, I can guarantee that I had lower agency at 14 than I had at 18. And I can guarantee it took me more than one year to build it, right? <laughs> um, that, then it puts some of the results we're seeing in context. So for instance, the average growth in agency we're seeing for a girl in one year is about 8% which seems low if you think of eight as a raw number, but in the context, that's almost 10% of the agency she'll achieve in her whole life in one year of programs. That's pretty good, Yeah. right? So we've been trying to kind of test with more places, more, more girls to see what are those normal numbers, what does look good, what doesn't look good, and really we just need more information. And um, I mean, you talked about sharing this, but I, yes. I'm interested in whether, um, you know, even your tool could be used here in the U.S. and yes. and whether yeah. you've done any efforts to spread that here. Yes, yeah. So the Girls Agency Lab, this project we're working on, GAL, this is a, a four-year effort. And at the end of that effort, we hope to have done enough rigorous study. So we're trying to apply this with 40 new organizations across five countries, uh, eight different language versions of the survey, um, once we have enough robust data to say this tool really works, this isn't a, a, a chance, right? This is not a blip mistake. Um, then we can start applying it in other locations where it hasn't previously been applied. Uh, that could include the U.S. Well, I know um, that we are right at the end of our of our evening, but this has been fascinating. I hope everyone else has found it fascinating. Um, <laughs> And I, I think it's something we would all love to continue to hear about it, what you're doing, Zach. So thanks for, for humoring my questions. And um, I can tell um, someone was just asking if you've worked with any refugees in the U.S. Yeah, I, it sounds like not yet. That's a great question. We do have some organizations in East Africa that are working okay. with refugee populations, but not yet in the U.S. Yeah, right. All right, Joe, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks. Um, I just want to remind everybody uh, that Together Women Rise depends on your donations to fund projects like the ones we heard about tonight and many more. You can go to our website, togetherwomenrise.org, to make a one-time online donation or to set up monthly giving and provide year-round support for organizations making a difference in the lives of women and girls. And I mentioned some upcoming events. I want to invite you to please join us on Tuesday, August 16th at 8.30 p.m. Eastern time for our next advocacy webinar. Our September national webinar will be on Thursday, September 1st at 8 p.m. Our guest speaker will be Wendy Daly, Head of Global Philanthropy for Everfree, our September featured grantee. I also want to encourage you to join us for a very special book club event on September 15th. We'll be featuring the book, Between the Mountain and Sky, A Mother's Story of Love, Loss, Healing, and Hope. Maggie Doyne, the co-founder and CEO of Blink Now Foundation in Nepal, is the author of this book, and it's a fabulous book. I'm about three quarters of the way through it. I can't wait to finish it. Um, and she'll be talking about her book and her journey. We've been privileged to have a long-standing relationship with Blink Now. And we know you'll want to join us. And again, that's September 15th at 8 p.m. Visit our website, togetherwomenrise.org, to sign up for events under the Join Us tab, as well as to view recordings of past events. We are so grateful to our speakers who were with us tonight to help us learn and understand the important work going on around the world. And uh, our gratitude to all of you for taking time from your day in order to join together um, in this community of, of learning and support. So I'm going to say good night to everybody. And thanks, Wendy, who always does a great job of navigating all the technology and all the questions.